Thank you for the for the introduction, Ann. So uh, I'm Brian Reed. Uh, I work at Now Secure. I have been in mobile and security since the BlackBerry was born. So that makes me an old mobile dinosaur. Um, today, I'm going to talk about creating an IoT connected mobile app compliance program leveraging the OWASP MASPS, otherwise known as how to take an OWASP standard and use it to create a new certification regime. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit today. Now, um, about 12 hours ago, 12 and a half hours ago, this awesome 20th anniversary event kicked off. And one of the first presentations uh, was Sven and Carlos giving us an update on the OWASP mobile project. And I'm guessing a decent number of people who were here were not up with me at 4 a.m. Eastern time this morning uh, to go through that. And I understand, you know, very much if you're not deeply passionate about mobile, you may not have been there. Um, but I took the liberty of snapping a couple of screenshots on their content, and I have them here. And uh, for those who know the, the OS Mobile Project, the two core pillars of the OS Mobile Project are the MASVS and the MSTG. A lot of work, a ton of work has gone into MASVS and maturing MASVS. This morning, uh, Carlos and Sven talked about updating the MSTG. And so uh, if you're used to the MSTG, uh, it is a less formalized, more manual oriented document. And the process of managing and updating the MSTG is not quite as well uh, organized, uh, nor is it as automated in the Get repo as MASVS. Uh, so they rolled out a new architecture this morning. Uh, and so now you can see there's a more organized structure here in terms of creating the MSTG and updating the MSTG. Uh, so looking at it from, from both the fundamentals and then getting into test cases, uh, testing techniques and tools as well, all in a much more organized fashion. Uh, so you're going to see this evolve. This is one of the next big projects that the team is on going forward. And there was another interesting thing. They actually had their own. Now, if you're a mobile person, you know all about Steve Jobs. One more thing. Uh, some rebranding is going on. So these are actually, this is the cover art for the MASVS and the MSTG and some graphical updates, as you can see from the last slide I showed you, as well as this slide of some changes there as well. And so I thought it'd be really great to give folks a quick update on uh, the OS Mobile Project here before I get barreling into my own. We started a few minutes early. Um, and so what I'd like to do now is transition into my own content. Uh, if the replay is available or you can get your whole hands on the slides uh, from earlier this morning, I do recommend you have a look at it. Huge thanks uh, to Carlos and Sven uh, for driving the OS Mobile Project, chairing it. Uh, both of them have been involved for many years and are continuing uh, with all kinds of excitement uh, to drive it forward. So I want to talk about how an organization and how a community can take the 20 years of history of OWASP and the maturing processes and documentation of OWASP and use it to create new compliance regimes. And so uh, a couple of years ago, a group got started, about a year, year and a half ago, a group got started saying, we need something for mobile connected IoT and VPN. And so uh, a group of us got together and started working on that. I want to share the story today. And it's kind of a different kind of perspective that I think is ideal for really the legacy of what OWASP has created. Now, just briefly, uh, as I was introduced, I'm the Chief Mobility Officer. What, what the hell does that title mean? What that actually means is I've been doing mobile uh, longer than my kids have been alive. Um, and from that perspective, whether you look at BlackBerry, which is the original mobile security company, all the way through to where we are with iOS and Android today, it's been really quite a journey. And I've been very excited to be in, in the core of many of the businesses that have driven that and partnered with Apple and Google and the other organizations along the way. Uh, my particular company, uh, we're actually the, the lead financial sponsor and have been since the inception of the OWASP mobile project. We also participate in creating tools for the OWASP mobile project involving the MESVS and the MSTG. Uh, if you know Frida and Radare, sort of the world's top reversing and disassembly tools, uh, the research teams that created Frida and Radare are uh, members of our organization, Frida and um, Ula and Pancake, for example. If you know them, we work with a lot of the kind of who's who. So if you need help with mobile AppSec, clearly uh, mobile is here for us. Now, to kind of tee this up, we spend so much time, uh, it, it, many times thinking about uh, the, the world economy driven on web apps, but the reality is that 69% of all digital time and traffic now actually is mobile apps and mobile apps now dominate usage in the marketplace. There were actually 130 billion apps downloaded during the pandemic last year alone, and it drives billions in, in economic value. And so 
mobile is there. And much like, you know, 15, 14, 13 years ago when the mobile project got started, you know, the reality is that 85% of all the apps we test, and in fact, 85% of the millions of apps in the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store have security vulnerabilities. You know, in the web world, we talk about cross-site scripting. Well, in the mobile world, insecure network connections and insecure data storage dominate. And in fact, 70% of those leak private data as well. And so the, the, the security issues for mobile apps are as big or more and as prevalent or more as they are in the web world. And that's why the OWASP mobile project got started. And that's why so many of us are investing in evolving that project. Now, if you've done pen testing in mobile or you've dug into some of those scary stats, what you find is about half of mobile apps uh, have insecure data storage, 48% uh, leak data over the network and secure networking. The good news is most of them are good at authentication and authorization. Um, and about 47% of exploitable extraneous functionality that shouldn't be there, right? So those are some pretty bad stats. We do benchmark uh, and analyze the app stores. I'll give you a link to get to the benchmark analytics at the end here if you want to see it. Uh, but the reality is that much like we all talk about cross-site scripting as being an example for web, the prevalence is there. So last year, a, a group of us got started with an organization called IOXT looking at IoT connected mobile apps. And uh, last uh, three years ago, uh, an organization called IOXT created a standard for certifying uh, the security of IoT devices and started thinking about what happens with mobile apps. And if you if you sub dumpster dive into looking at uh, mobile connected apps, so those are apps that talk to things in your house. Those are apps that talk to iRobot or talk to your car like uh, Ford or Tesla or talk to uh, industrial production equipment, HVAC in your building, what have you. Uh, so both industrial consumer apps and many different kinds of things. What you find is they're pretty bad too. And so while we're scared about, we're concerned about, uh, and we're starting to, to, to publicize about issues of IoT devices being insecure, the reality is mobile apps are insecure too. And those mobile apps that connect to them are often the breach uh, angles, angles. And so in benchmarking about 250, 270 of the most prevalent common apps, uh, we found about 87% had data storage issues, encryption issues, and so on and so forth. Some of them did a really great job with credentials, which was awesome, and, and authentication again. So those sides are, are being addressed pretty well. There's a link to this benchmark you can see that you'll be able to go to afterwards to kind of understand it. So what do we do about this? So IOXT uh, formed over five years ago. Uh, it's really the who's who of all of the IoT device manufacturers. You have Google and Amazon and things like Ring Doorbell in there, uh, Sonos and, and uh, uh, numerous consumer and industrial uh, IoT organizations are part of it. And it, it's a standards body that created a certification regime for uh, IoT things. And they've done certification regimes for a number of other things, but they're, they're started with, founded on uh, IoT device certification. So a group of us, Google, Amazon, Now Secure, NCC Group, Seven Layers, and Durka, uh, with a handful of others in review, got together and said, hey, what can we do about creating a certification regime for uh, mobile apps that connect to IoT devices? And while we're at it, some members of the VPN community joined as well. And we said, okay, so mobile apps and mobile VPNs, uh, what can we do about that? And so the group got together and got started on a project. And I'm going to take you through the story of the project. So what was the objective? Well, the objective was to create a reasonable, reliable uh, industry standard to build, test, and certify the security of mobile apps that connect to, uh, directly to, uh, or through crowd services to IoT things and VPNs. And I think the key word here is certify, right? So there are existing standards like OWASP on how to build and test, but there is no publicly available and publicly agreed to certification regime. And because IOXT was having a lot of success with certifying the security of devices, they thought it would be logical to then extend that to things that connect the devices, which are mobile apps and other things. And so we got together, started working through this and with uh, many of the device vendors right here with, uh, for example, Google and Amazon. And so, you know, the first series of brainstorming sessions were, well, should we build this from scratch, right? And I don't know how many of you have ever been a part of coming up with a new idea, but for some reason, most of the time we tend to start with, well, let's build from scratch, right? And you start putting ideas in the board and you start thinking through the semantics of it and you think about, you know, where's the edge of the envelope and all the rest. And that kind of after a meeting or two moved pretty quickly into, well, maybe it'd be better if we started with some existing standards or regulations. So we went over to Europe, we looked at the ISO stuff, we looked at CIS, and here in the States, we looked at NIST, and we looked at OWASP. 
And in doing all of this, there were pros and cons for, you know, leveraging the different regimes. And, you know, depending on your organization, for example, you might be, you know, using the the, the MITRE ATT&CK framework or some of the NIST standards or the ISO standards in your organization as a, a, a security framework overall uh, to protect your enterprise. And so going through it, it became really pretty clear pretty quickly um, that OWASP was the place to go and MASVS was the real foundation for us to take what MASVS was, make extensions or modifications to it for what's relevant to IOXT, or excuse me, what's relevant to IoT devices and VPNs, um, and extend it into a certification regime uh, beyond a, a security standard and testing regime. And you know, we and uh, we who are sponsored of the mobile project and very deep in it, uh, our, our friends at Google who are huge on leveraging standards uh, in OWASP and some of the others said, that's absolutely the way to go, here we go. Now, as we started merging in the VPN stuff, we grabbed some, some core components from the VPN trust initiative as well. And so what I'd like to do is kind of walk you through how we went about doing this. So first we took a look at the OWASP project resources uh, and clearly the MASVS and the MSTG are the core. It's evolved a lot since the OWASP mobile top 10. So we started digging into that, right? And if you've been through the MASVS and you've been through the MSTG, you'll be familiar with some of these things. So uh, OWASP, the MASVS, uh, the project team recognized in the OWASP mobile project that really there were four levels and categories, right? So we had this, this basic L1, which is a standard level of security that meets a certain, I'll, we'll call it a low threat model threshold. Uh, and then L2 is this idea of defense in depth. So if I have regulated data, if I have compliance uh, and so forth, you know, that's more than, than a simple app. So, you know, simple MASVS L1 security standard app might be like a book, a conference room app, right? And uh, uh, or look up a, a map of a building. The level two might be book a conference room. Um, but now when you get into something like a financial app, or maybe you get into a mobile connected app where the mobile app is a, a blood pressure or a, a blood uh, uh, insulin injector type of thing, you need resilience. And so the, the L1 plus R and L2 plus R was look, really looking at, at resiliency with the idea of a self-defending application. So if I'm L1, I'm at a lower level, but I have some IP protection and maybe some, some malicious modification. If I'm L2 plus R, now you're into doing complex activities with sensitive data and where uh, sensitive data and IP protection really are critical. So think of your classic banking app. Think of the app that drives industrial machinery or manages and maintains an airplane, right? Those kinds of things need the highest level, which is L2 plus R. And so working through the MASVS levels, we're like, okay, we need a leveling system. We need to think about resiliency. We need to think about a, a structure to that. Further, we looked into the domain. So MASVS has eight domains, right? And so we're looking at everything from architecture and threat modeling all the way through data storage, uh, into cryptography, into authentication and session management, into the network layer, uh, environmental interactions, right? There's some unique characteristics of a mobile device versus a laptop or a web, web uh, environment. Uh, everyone needs to worry about code quality. And then obviously there's that resiliency, the, the plus R here that we talked about earlier. Now, if you remember my stats earlier, basically data storage and network communications are a train wreck in mobile. Uh, and so we needed to think about that as we got into the mobile connected IoT and mobile VPN side of the house. You may also remember that authentication and session management were actually pretty good uh, from that perspective as well. And so we're working our way through this. We're looking at those benchmarks and the analytics of, of uh, uh, analyzing the mass scale of IoT connected apps and, and VPN mobile apps and things like that. And so we said, okay, let's create a regime now that will meet our, our requirements. So within IOXT, there was already a structure. Within MASVS, there was already a structure. So we wanted to harmonize uh, and bring all of that together, which is what you'll see here in the picture. And so we settled on, while well, MASVS had you know, over 80 requirements, we settled on 30 key requirements that are truly relevant uh, to an IoT and a VPN world and organized them across eight pledge categories. Now, some of the pledge categories I'm going to show you in a minute are the same as what's in MASVS, and some are different, right? Because they're more relevant to certification-oriented regimes that are beyond uh, traditional uh, security uh, requirements. Now, one of the core characteristics here was recognizing that if you're going to have a certification regime, 
it's very brutal if you force everybody to meet a common bar. The reality is, in many ways, uh, a number of other types of certification regimes enable different levels. So you can be sort of lightly certified versus middle certified versus deeply or, or heavily certified. And so what we did is created this ability to have different levels and there's mandatory levels. That's that minimum bar that everybody has to meet. But the optional levels really enable organizations to choose, right? So as a developer uh, in building a new mobile connected IoT app, I can choose whether I want to be highly differentiated by providing a super high level uh, of certification or maybe a lower level of certification for a lower bar. Maybe I have a more economical or a cheaper product. Maybe I charge a premium for the higher level. And then for the consumer, for the consumer, that gives them transparency. Oh, this is a level one or two or three, right? And depending on which level, now I understand what minimum bar they meet. And so it's really great for both the consumer and the vendor having this levels of differentiation. Now, in order to, to be successful, what we learned from IoT device certification is really need to establish some policy requirements, not just security requirements. And we'll show you those in a second. Um, and as part of that, then, as I mentioned before, having this notion of minimum certification requirements. And so when we think about MAS and MSTG, organizations use them as a testing regime, but there's no, there's no like public mechanism or, or, or standard way to say, hey, I passed these components of MSTG, that makes me this sort of certified vendor according to OWASP. That's not the premise of OWASP is to certify people. But the premise of the IOXT world is to certify people. So we, we build on MASVS and MSTG and we actually create certification requirements. And then of course, there are some things that are kind of unique to IoT and VPN. We wanted to make sure that the right elements were in there. Sometimes those are sub descriptors or uh, test case scenarios that are specific to something related to IoT or VPN that maybe doesn't exist in the broader world of, of more general uh, applications. So I'd like to show you what this looks like. So uh, first we have the application profile that was created and it's a simple 19-page uh, document, uh, very simple uh, compared to the thickness of MAS and MSTG. However, uh, inside it's footnoted everywhere uh, with links and credits back to the MAS VS and the MSTG. Uh, so along with the application profile, we have a compliance test case library. Uh, so basically like there's an MAS VS and MSTG, there's the profile and there's the test case library. And inside the test case library, there are references to the MSTG, much like they're inside the profile, there's references to the MAS VS. And so as we jump into this, here you can see very specifically in the, in the, test, uh, in the testing guide, here on the left, we're at uh, UP103, so authentication of remote services. And you'll see the description of how to test and what are the requirements for uh, building and testing the application. And all the footnotes link back to something in the MAS VS. For almost everything in the, MS, in the uh, testing guide here for IOXT, there is a link back to the MASVS or the MSTG as a source or reference point for more information. And so we found this very synergistic pattern means that any development team using the MASVS and any, any um, testing team using the MSTG can very easily move into and take advantage of IOXT certification because there's such a commonality between the two. They just need to adapt to some of the unique differences that I'll show you as well. So much like the OSP MASVS has uh, the four boxes here, we have the mobile application profile. There are actually uh, eight sections at the bottom. Uh, and as you can see in each one, um, there is a stack diagram that basically represents different levels. And so the levels uh, escalate as you go up. So deeper and deeper, more sophisticated requirements, higher degree of certifi uh, security certification occurs as you move up uh, in each of these sections. And then within each section, you're going to notice some things as well. And so I'm going to kind of peel this apart. So in my build here, the first thing we're going to see in the build here is uh, to go in the top right, we have the required uh, yellow arrow. And so as you look through each section, there are minimum required standards to achieve uh, IOXT certification. So for example, if I look at the secured interfaces, you can see that uh, SI1 and SI2, SI110, uh, uh, 111, and 112, those are all required. Now the 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is based on some core IOXT standards and certification levels. Uh, so the, the red, uh, excuse me, the sort of pink, fuchsia, uh, blue, gray, orange mapping uh, maps across other types of IOXT certifications. 
And then as you level up, you've got the MASVS items pulled over. And so you can see, for example, for secured interfaces uh, that you actually have to have all the way up to that bar. Now that's minimum required certification. Now, if I want to enforce uh, if I want to achieve the higher level, the level four certification, then that means I need to uh, incorporate uh, SI113, which is basically enforcing X509 certificates. And so we can walk our way across this from a, a password level through cryptography to security by default to verified software, automatic software updates, vulnerability reporting, and, and security expiration. We can see that there's varying levels of requirements uh, within uh, each of these. And those varying level of, of requirements are, again, getting to minimum requirements that then are predictable and consistent uh, for the audience. Now, as we dive into this, there's another area of unique additions, and that's really around policy. And so some of the things we have experienced around the IOXT side and experienced around the sort of lack in, in OWASP from MASVS are around these. So verified software, right? So is there something that actually verifies and certifies that anti-rollback is in there, that proven cryptography is in there, uh, that images are signed and verified and so on and so forth. So verified software is an excellent policy uh, for true in a, in a certification regime. Vulnerability reporting is also important. Um, so do you have a public disclosure program, right? Do you have it in place? Are you uh, running a bug bounty programming? Are you monitoring for it? Can you prove that you're monitoring for it? Uh, and so on and so forth. And we believe in responsible disclosure. We do it a lot to help organizations. And this is important really to uh, have, a, have an effective program. And then expiration date is also very important. So if you think about a physical device, like if I have a thing, it's got a fixed chipset in it, I may or may not be able to update that firmware and technology moves so fast that the reality is you should have a security cert, uh, expiration on that. Uh, and, and we should think about it at the software level for applications as well. And so security expiration date is a key difference between OWASP uh, and IOXT, but it's an important difference because that's really enabling organizations to understand how long can I trust this based on the velocity of the market, based on the standard that I use, based on the cert certification level that I have. And that really forces the upgrade cycles that we all know are so critically important. And enabling people or, or not including them means that a, a potential set of vulnerabilities could be introduced or the opportunity for uh, risk is, is escalated if I don't actually have a regime that expires. And so that was an important addition as well uh, as we built this all out. And so we're really excited now because here we are and there's some uh, 50 uh, mobile applications and uh, VPNs that have been certified uh, by now secure, but also there's uh, over 200 that have been certified. I failed to mention before that the, uh, the IOXT uh, mobile application profile regime was announced February of this year, so February of 2021. And so in the first six or seven months, we've had hundreds of mobile connected uh, IoT application vendors, uh, as well as uh, VPN vendors come through the certification process uh, and achieve certification. So it is working very well. Uh, it's also been very interesting when we look at some of these policy levels. Remember, we said that the uh, notion of required uh, allowed organizations to meet a certain minimum bar, but organizations could differentiate it. Uh, and it's been interesting watching the VPN vendors, for example, uh, some of the VPN vendors who only met the minimum level recognized their competitors were achieving level three or four, and so from a competitive differentiation perspective, they found themselves at a competitive disadvantage. And so the regime worked because the buyer community could see the differences in certification between VPN vendors. And some of those VPN vendors went back, improved their products, and then came back and got the higher level of certification. And so when we think back to the mission of OWASP and the use of OWASP as a really guiding principle for mobile application developers and for mobile application security testing professionals, the IOXT certification creates a new layer or a new layer of value on top of what we were already doing, adding that compliance, compliance layer and that compliance regime to it, which actually really helps drive the market. And so while development teams are working better and security testing teams are working better, now we have an ability to uh, apply certifications to them uh, for the public marketplace. We see this working really well uh, for uh, IoT connected devices and VPNs. We see this going many other places. 
And so if we kind of think about the evolution now, MASVS and, and uh, MSTG and the OS Mobile Project, they're barreling down the path. They're very mature, but as I showed earlier at the beginning, uh, we're working on some tune-ups for the MSTG. We're working on more tooling. We're working more education and all of those great things. Um, and now it's it's mature enough that you're able to build certification regimes on top of it, like the IOXT uh, mobile application profile. Uh, and where is it going? Well, there's some interesting work going on with Etsy uh, and Etsy 30, uh, EN 303645. Uh, um, and so there's some... Uh, opportunity here to, to build on what IOXT has done uh, with the mobile application profile and uh, testing certification with what Etsy's doing. Uh, and we see a, a good opportunity for those two to compound together uh, and grow things to the next level as well. And so if, uh, if you're attending this session today uh, because you are an IoT or the VPN world uh, and you've been watching or participating in IOXT, uh, come join us also with the Etsy group. A lot of the IOXT members are participating with Etsy as well. Uh, and there's likely congruence that's going to happen as these, uh, these come together uh, organizationally and structurally. So really, it's OSP, you know, it's OSP for the win uh, uh, from this perspective. Again, I've been doing standards going all the way back to ANSI and ISO uh, back before I had gray hair. Uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, I was in the ANSI SQL standards bodies for 89 and 91. Uh, have worked with other standards groups uh, over the year, a lot of standards related to BlackBerry in the early days and now OWASP in the last decade. Uh, and I'm really excited to see how well uh, OWASP has matured, uh, listening to you know, Andrew, Andrew Vanderstock and, and the other founders, uh, Mark, who was just before me. Um, it's amazing evolution uh, here. And now we have certification regimes and expanded standards being built on uh, OS, which has become the core standards for the world. So we're very excited about that. Um, got a bunch of resources for you. So if you're if you're uh, interested in Freedom Radari and reversing and mobile testing, uh, you've got some links here. Uh, free to the world. There's been you know tens of thousands of downloads. Please come participate in those projects as well. Uh, now Secure does a number of crack knees, uh, along with spec work. So we recently, uh, as part of our two con last year, uh, a group at R2 got together and created an Android crack me. Uh, so if you're working your way through developing your skills in the OWASP uh, suite, you can go into the uh, OWASP Acme, uh, Crack Me and download it and have some fun with that as well. Uh, the R2 community continues to work collaboratively with, with the OWASP community. Um, I talked about some of the benchmarks earlier. So there's a couple of benchmarks here. So uh, um, uh, the big one is in the middle, the App Store Risk Tracker. Uh, so that is analyzing the millions of apps in the App Store and giving aggregated data around security risks and privacy issues. No, we're not outing any individual vendors, but all the vendors you know that are top manufacturers and 15 verticals are there that can give you, give you some more background on what's going on and, and give you a path to uh, uh, testing yourself. Um, like OWASP, uh, we have a lot of free mobile app stock training. So now Secure Academy is a free training environment. If you're new to mobile or a new mobile pen tester, there's lots of courseware for you uh, to learn about it. We're big believers in standards. We're big believers in skills development. So take advantage of now Secure Academy. You can sign up for free and learn a ton and continue layering into that. If you're a Freedom Radari hounds, we have Freedom Radari courseware coming soon to you uh, as well. If you're a web pen tester and want to learn how to be a mobile pen tester, there's courseware for you there. And if you're a, a mobile application developer, there's a secure mobile development uh, best practices in there as well. Uh, we will be adding IOXT courseware going forward as well. So I uh, want to thank you all for, for joining me today in this track and uh, taking you on the journey of you know, 20 years of OWASP has led to now certification regime uh, where IOXT has been able to leverage the OWASP, MASVS, and MSTG to turn it into a certification uh, and testing regime uh, for IoT connected mobile apps and for VPNs. And we're super excited about that. Uh, Brooke Davis from Google was going to present with me. She was not able to today. So, uh, but Google's been a big part of this journey and a cornerstone in the journey. And we're glad to have them along for the ride. So I'm all finished today. Please hit me up. I'm going to jump over into, I believe, the topics of interest Slack. And so I'll be there for questions and comments. I will also be posting a copy, a PDF copy of this slide deck over there. You can also hit me up at my email address or find me on Twitter. And I'd love to talk mobile AppSec with you if you're up for it. So welcome back, Ann.